You might be surprised to learn that there's a lot of information contained in these old pottery shirts. It's not in here as written information, but nonetheless, there is a lot of knowledge in these shirts. Knowledge about how this pottery was made. And if we can learn to interpret the information in these shirts, then we can learn how to recreate pottery types that haven't been made in centuries. I read a lot of archeological publications, and that's a good way to learn about ancient pottery. You can learn how it was made, you can learn about the materials it was made with, all kinds of things, but it's not the best way. The problem is books are written by people and people make mistakes. And so the archeologists that write these books sometimes get things wrong, but the sherds themselves never lie. We might misinterpret the information in the sherds, but the sherds themselves are always truthful about how they were made. And so today I'm gonna to talk about some of those things that we as humans get wrong. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about three wrong assumptions that people make about ancient pottery and how the sherds themselves can help to unlock the truth. So the first wrong assumption we're gonna talk about is this, that if a pottery is found in abundance in a specific location, it must have been made there. It's an easy assumption to make because it's usually true. Take for example, members black on white. It is found in the most abundance in a specific area of southwestern New Mexico along the Membrus River and the Upper Gila. And archaeological studies of this ceramic has shown us that it was actually manufactured only in those areas where it is super abundant. So it's usually safe to assume that if you find pottery in abundance in a location, it was manufactured there. But it's not always true. And let me explain a story that shows how that is so the story of Roosevelt Black on White. Harold S. Gladwin was a wealthy New York stockbroker who moved west in the early 1920s to pursue scientific interests. At first, he studied butterflies at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Next, he became interested in the ancient cultures of Arizona. In 1928, he and his wife established the Gila Pueblo Archaeological Foundation in Globe, Arizona where he helped to first identify and define the Hohokam culture. In the course of his archaeological investigation, he performed work in the area around Roosevelt Lake, where he first defined the Salado culture. It was while working here that he found abundant sherds from a black-on-white pottery type that he named Roosevelt Black-on-White. As these archaeologists studied the area around Roosevelt Lake, however, they found that there was no naturally occurring white clay nearby. So how were the ancient potters making whiteware pottery? One archaeologist even went so far as to suggest that when the Salado immigrated into the Roosevelt area, they brought the white clay with them on their backs. Any pottery replicator will tell you that white slip might be carried long distances because a little slip can cover many pots. But a building clay has to come from within just a few miles of the producing village. And the geology of Arizona dictates that good white clays are generally limited to the area above the Mogollon Rim, which is about 75 miles north of Roosevelt Lake. So there was no way this black on white pottery was being produced in that area, no matter how abundant the sherds were there. But archeologists can be a hard nosed lot and it wasn't until 1995 that Roosevelt black on white pottery was debunked and shown to be just Tularosa black on white trade wear. And the second wrong assumption I'm gonna talk about is the one that says that people always made pottery like their ancestors did. This again is generally true. One good example of this being true is the story of the Cayenta Anazazi. They originated in an area in North Central Arizona and about 1275, they moved south to the Mogollon Rim and then down into the low desert of Southern Arizona. And we can track the movement of the Cayenta Anazazi by their pottery because they made this beautiful redware back in their homeland. And as they moved, they continued to make similar pottery. And so clear down in Southern Arizona, hundreds of miles away from the Cayenta homeland, we find redware pottery that is almost identical to that that was made in the Cayenta area. And so they were making pottery as they had learned from their ancestors. They were holding fast to their pottery tradition. This is a great example of that assumption that people always make pottery like their ancestors. But again, it's not always true. I'll give you two good examples. The first one is to go back to the members we talked about earlier. 
That member's black and white pottery was made, as I said, in a specific area of southwestern New Mexico. Come about 1150 AD, the member's culture collapsed and that pottery type ceased to be made. A lot of the member's people immigrated out of that area, but wherever they went, they weren't making member's pottery because it ceased to be made at that time. A lot of archeologists believe that some of the members migrated south where they helped to form the Casas Grandes culture, which developed just around that time. But yet, Casas Grandes pottery is very, very different from members' pottery. It's fired differently. It uses different paint pigments. It's just very different pottery. And so any of those members' people that migrated south to develop the Casas Grandes culture obviously discontinued making pottery in their traditions and started a whole new pottery tradition there in Chihuahua. The second example of this is the Hopis. The Hopi people are made up of many different clans, and each of those clans has an oral history about where their ancestors came from. And so they know that the people that live in Hopi today came together from people that were all over the ancient Southwest. Some of them farther to the west and south in central Arizona, some of them to the south and east in New Mexico. From all over, people came to form the Hopi. And if you go to these ancient villages in Hopi, you'll find that they all made very similar pottery, what we call Hopi yellowware. And so as those people came together from around the Southwest, they obviously left behind those pottery traditions from where they came from and formed a new pottery tradition there in Hopi, much like the members did in Northern Chihuahua. And that brings me to the third wrong assumption about ancient pottery that I'm gonna talk about. And that is this. People think that if they find a pottery that is being made in a specific area, that it must be made with materials that are local to that area. And again, this is usually true. We can take as an example of this, whole red on buff pottery. Most of that whole red on buff pottery was made near Snake Town on the Gila River. And if we go down along the Gila in the Snake Town area today, you will find all the raw materials needed to make that. You will find that buff firing clay, you'll find the schist that they tempered with, and you'll find that red hematite pigment, all fairly local to that area around Snake Town. And so it's usually true that if a pottery is made in an area, that the materials are relatively local to that area. But it's not always true. The exception to this is Salado Polychrome. Salado Polychrome was made across a broad area, and in some ways it used materials from that broad area. But it also was very dependent on a specific ingredient that came from trade. Although Salado Polychrome was first identified and named in the 1930s, for decades nobody paid much attention to the white slip that was the background for the painted designs. White clay is as rare as hen's teeth in southern Arizona where most of this stuff was made, but nobody seemed to realize that that was a problem. I started trying to reproduce Salado pottery as early as 1990, and I soon figured out that the material that they were using was not commonly available in this area. Over the course of many years, I sampled clays and other minerals from all across the Salado core area, and I discovered that the right material that would allow organic paint to become black designs and would stay relatively white in an oxidation firing atmosphere was nowhere to be found here. Where were the ancient Salado potters getting all this important ingredient to their pottery? In desperation, I began researching the history of Salado polychrome pottery. I discovered that archeologists had pinpointed the area where this type of pottery was first made, and it was outside what is considered the Salado core area. It is above the Mogollon Rim, an area with totally different geology that is rich in white clay deposits. I found that the technology of painting organic designs on surface-fired oxidized pottery had first been developed along the Puerco River near Petrified Forest National Park. And so I went looking for a suitable white slip in this area and BAM! There were numerous clays available up there that would do the trick. The trouble is those places were like 150 miles away from these ancient villages along the Salt and Gila rivers where most Salado polychrome pottery was produced back in the 1300s. So it must be that those ancient Salado potters were dependent on trade to provide the white slip they needed to make their pottery. 
trade that was moving small amounts of clay over 150 miles across deserts and mountains. Much of the information about how this pottery was made and the materials used are here to be found if you know what to look for. Take, for example, Salado Polychrome, which we were just talking about. There's a lot of questions about Salado and what was going on at that time. For example, it started to be made suddenly around 1300 AD, and about 150 years later, it stopped being made just as suddenly. If you're interested in learning more about Salado, check out this video right over here. It goes on a deep dive into Salado Polychrome and what we can learn about it by studying the ancient shirts. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.